Greetings, friends. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In today's episode, I had a fun, stimulating conversation with a senior legal executive on her experience with legal recruiters and also her advice as you consider your next opportunity. Also, we spoke about what leaders inspired her, advice for minority attorneys, and her reflection on the matter of race in our country. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on iTunes. We interview corporate defense, law firm leaders, partners, general counsel, and legal consultants. You're listening to episode 45 of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of both men and women serving as leaders and executives in the legal industry. Enjoy a front row seat as Chris Batt speaks with general counsel, legal consultants, and law firm leaders and law partners at the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Batts with The Lion Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Sherry Williams, a senior legal executive. Sherry is a 20-year legal veteran and senior corporate legal executive. Her most recent role, she served as VP, Deputy General Counsel, Global Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer for JBIL. She also served as a compliance consultant and was formerly the SVP, Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer for Halliburton, where she led the company's global ethics and compliance function. She also practiced complex commercial litigation, employment law, and class action defense for seven years at K&L Gates, an AMLAW 100 firm. She earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Oklahoma and law degree from the University of Miami School of Law. Welcome, Sherry, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Hi, Chris. It's great to be here. I sincerely appreciate the invitation, and I very much look forward to our conversation. Let's jump in and talk about recruiting. Sherry, throughout your career, you've spoken with, worked with different recruiters. Would you describe to us your impressions of the recruiting process? I think that the recruiting process um, varies depending on what level you are in your career. And I think that when you get to C-suite level recruiting, which is the recruiting that I've been privy to most often, You know, there are some organizations that just do a really good job of attempting to match the right candidate with the right position and with the right cultural fit of the organization. And what I've found is when I've worked with recruiters that take that approach, it tends to be a really positive experience, whether or not you're ultimately chosen for the job because you feel like you had a legitimate shot at the job versus some instances where I felt that recruiters are going out and they're just rounding up really anybody that has the right title or even marginally the right experience, but they're not really digging deeper to see if that opportunity would be a fit for the particular candidates they're reaching out to. Thank you, Sherry. Yes, unfortunately, some recruiters submit candidates simply to achieve an internal or external performance goal, which does not serve anyone. Would you share what myths attorneys bring to the recruiting process? I think that a lot of times attorneys will have some idea that the recruiter is a 100% advocate for the candidate. And I think that's a myth because I think recruiters are in kind of a tough position, especially if it is a retained search, which means that they're really working for the company who is looking to place someone in a key position. And I think the best recruiters balance out their role as really an advocate for their client who's retained them versus how they advocate for candidates in front of that client. I think there are some organizations that do that balance very well. I think other organizations don't. And so if if someone is new to the recruiting process, especially at a C-suite level, I think one of the myths that they have is that, well, this recruiter is really advocating for me. 
And sometimes they can do that, but that's not really their job. And so I think that if you're new to the recruiting process, you really want to understand with your recruiter what role they're going to take in advocating for you, especially if it's a role that you think you really want and you may be particularly suited for. I 100% agree, Sherry. We do all that we can to empathize and explain to our candidates the limits of our advocacy and the tension we walk to serve the clients well. Right. And I think that, you know, part of it is about understanding how to communicate and stay in touch with recruiters in the right way. And I can say that in my experience, there have been instances where I've been uncomfortable reaching out to a recruiter, even if it's someone with whom I've had a relationship, to say, hey, I'm in the market. Do you have anything for me? There is this sense that you should sit around and wait for them to call you. And I think there, again, is a fine balance in that. And again, some of the best recruiters I've worked with actually stay in touch with me. They will reach out a couple of times a year. They will send me an article about leadership. And what that in turn does is gives me a opportunity and a path to then reach out to them if something has changed in my career and I might be looking for a new opportunity. And so I think that's really relevant. But, you know, to your point about myths, I think the other myth is that people think recruiters are just sitting on thousands and thousands of open jobs that are good for everybody, where in fact, again, depending on where you are in the hierarchy, especially in legal, they really may not have thousands of searches going on at your level, especially since lots of large organizations will try to recruit internally via LinkedIn and their online job posting systems before doing a retained search. So I think that the way in which recruiters are retained has also changed a bit. What advice would you give an attorney who is thinking of approaching and utilizing a recruiter? I would first say, you know, check your own personal brand, because I think very often, or at least in my experience, I'll I'll limit it to my experience. I have had colleagues and peers and other people provide my name to recruiters in advance of me being called for a position and at a time in my career where I did not have those independent recruiting relationships. So I think the very first thing would be to ensure that you have a good brand and that, you know, your peers and colleagues think well of you and know what your skills are. Secondarily, I would say because recruiters are very often having to evaluate the entire package, not just your skills for the job, but your leadership skills, your personality, your ability to fit into a variety of cultures that candidates need to understand. There really is rarely a quote off the record with the recruiter. And so whereas you want to have a sincere and authentic relationship, you really do, I think, have to have some balance and carefulness in how you interact with that person. So Sherry, what I hear you saying is that candidates should try to be prepared when talking with recruiters, knowing who they are and what they bring to the table. Correct. And it sounds like also to discuss what they really want with the recruiter. Well, and I think that there are instances, and I have had very good conversations with recruiters about what I want, where they reach out, they're exploring something with me that maybe I don't want. And I think two things about that are important. One, you really should give the information to them of someone who may want that position, right? So if you can refer a name that is always really positive. The second thing is if you don't want the position that they're calling you about, you know, if you can turn that conversation in such a way 
where you can, in fact, talk to them about what you're looking for. I think that's positive, And I think they very often agree with that and appreciate it. Sherry, let's talk for a moment about the different ways legal recruiters have been a resource to you as a legal executive. I have been very fortunate to have very good experiences when I have been in searches with recruiters being very transparent about what the benefits package looks like. So I think that if you're, especially you're a C-suite executive and there are particular things that you want to have available to you, say relocation or other types of benefits, I think that's a time to be really honest with your recruiter to find out what it is that the company with which you're interviewing has on the table. And I've found people have been very helpful to me about total compensation discussions where if the salary is not quite what you want, what are other ways that can be made up? Issues like that, I think if you have a good relationship with your recruiter, you can talk very honestly about the things that you want and the good ones will help you try to achieve that goal sort of within reason based upon their, you know, sort of dual position, both representing their client and advocating for you. Yes, I agree. Recruiters can be advocates for candidates within reason and also serve their clients. Have you found recruiters to be insightful for market intelligence or your market value? You know, I think I have, but not so much in the midst of an actual search, right? So this goes back to the discussion that we had a little bit earlier around what happens when you're trying to keep in touch, right? So there have been instances in my career where I have, you know, had conversations with recruiters and said, You know, I may not be prepared to move right now, but I'm thinking about what my next steps are. What do you see in the market? And I have in instances gotten some very um, helpful feedback in that regard. And I think people who are very good at their jobs, especially some of the larger recruiting organizations, tend to have a really nice pulse both nationally within the U.S., but also internationally. Sherry, you have mentioned to me one particular recruiter that stood out to you. Would you describe some of the qualities of this recruiter that you felt separated this person from the rest of the pack? So I would say, first and foremost, it's an organization that um, spent a lot of time, I think, getting to know me and my qualifications. And so the vetting process was actually fairly detailed. I think that the first time we probably had a two and a half hour, you know, meeting with lots of conversation and lots of notes being taken and lots of questions being asked about not only my qualifications, but what I wanted to do in the future. And that was with a particular senior level person several, several years ago. And since that time, I've worked with that firm in their Houston, Texas office, in their, you know, New Jersey office, in their Washington, D.C. office. And I have gotten consistent service across the board in terms of people saying, you know, we keep you in mind and these are the kinds of roles we think you'd be good for. Do you have different ideas? We don't want to put you in a box. We want to make sure that we're aligned with the kind of things that you want to do. And I've always gotten the feeling that there are conversations happening around the people who work with me, that they're talking to each other. It's not a cold call. When I talk to someone new, they will say, well, I've spoken to this person in the New York office about you or this person in the Houston office about you, and we're big fans of yours. And I appreciate them not just for the nice things that they said, but you know, there are always instances where I think candidates will interview and feel like they didn't quite hit it out of the ballpark. And what has set this firm apart for me is they have given me very crisp and concise and constructive feedback in instances where I might have misstepped. 
And those missteps have never precluded me from being considered for other searches. And they tend to follow up. It's, it's a situation where if I am no longer in consideration, it's not a black hole. They call me and say, hey, the clients decided to do X and Y. Or if I'm moving to the next level, they will say, hey, we're moving you forward. And here are some tips we think you should have and you should take into account as you go and talk to this next set of representatives of the company. And I've found that to be immensely helpful. And I've also found that not very many organizations do it. Did you find that those qualities were consistent in the organization or unique to the individual? It has been my consistent experience across the organization. You brought up something that I want to address. You mentioned the possibility of being stuck in a black hole or basically lack of communication with the recruiter. Would you say that this is the greatest area of improvement for recruiters? I would say that it is. And partially because, you know, you get the call that someone is considering you, whether they email you or they call you or they talk to you on LinkedIn. And then, you know, what I always say to candidates, if they're asking me, even if it's a preliminary call with the recruiter, take the time to prepare, learn about that recruiting organization, learn about the person you're talking to. And if they have disclosed the identity of the company, at least take the time to learn something preliminary about the company so that that first conversation is meaningful. And when you take that amount of time to prepare after the initial conversation, there's a high probability that they're not going to move along to put in front of the client everyone they had the preliminary conversations with. But taking the time to say, we had a lot of candidates, we thought you were very good, but some of them are more, you know, in the sweet spot of what this client is looking for, we appreciate your time, would go a long way. And very often that just doesn't happen. You just never hear from them again. So there hasn't been a consistent level of communication to bring closure to the process, if I heard you correctly. I think that's a great way to put it. Any final comments about recruiting? I want to transition to another topic. Well, I just think that people need to recognize that to some extent, the job search process has changed and recruiters are still a fantastic way to get opportunities. But there are also other ways that one needs to look for a job if they're in the market. And so don't pass up on making sure your LinkedIn brand is very good. Don't pass on ensuring that you're going to various job sites, whether it's goinhouse.com or other sites like that, to ensure that you're really understanding what is out there because your dream job may not be coming through a recruiter in 2020. Hi listeners, this is Chris Batts, legal recruiter and owner of The Lion Group. My team and I place legal and compliance talent around the United States and are known for our level of communication, speed, and strong track record. If you're an employer hiring your first attorney or first general counsel or adding talent to your corporate legal department or compliance team, we should talk. Also, if you're a corporate defense law partner or group wondering about your options for a lateral move, we should also talk. Every aspect of our process is confidential, fast, and thorough. Contact us by going to our website, findthelions.com, or you can text the word HEADHUNTER to the number 44222, and then complete the web form, and we'll follow up with you shortly. Now back to the show. Let's talk about leadership. Sherry, how do you define leadership? I would probably say that I define leadership as putting the team first and ensuring that your modus operandi as the leader is focused on taking an interest in people, ensuring fairness, giving respect, and treating people with dignity and respect, and really a great deal of honesty associated with managing people and helping them to manage their careers. So when you say honesty, are you meaning meaningful feedback and transparency? 
I mean meaningful feedback and transparency, which very often is not provided at all, or if it is provided, it's not provided timely. But I think it's also being honest about expectations in an upfront way. I don't think it helps employees when you get honest feedback at your review or at your end of your review when there is something that you could have been told that would have improved your productivity or improved team morale that could have been a five or 10 minute conversation six months earlier. And so I think a give and take around expectations and real time constructive conversation is very important when you're a leader. Sherry, who has been examples of leadership for you? Oh my God, I would probably say my first real example of leadership was in my law firm when I was at k l Gates, which at the time was known as Kirkpatrick and Lockhart. I had the privilege of working for a partner named Stuart Singer. And as a young associate, I actually made a huge mistake. And rather than deciding he was never going to work with me again, or that he was going to sort of put me on the outskirts, he had a very, very honest conversation with me about how I had disappointed him because he expected more and he knew I could do more. And the next time he gave me an opportunity, you can bet I did everything in my power to hit it out of the ballpark. Another person at that firm, again, very young in my career, was a gentleman named Greg Breitbart. And Greg would sort of call me in his office at the end of the day and say, hey, these are the things that went on. Let's talk about how those went. And it was always done in a very fair and transparent way. And I really give credit to both of those men for helping me build my confidence around working hard and and walking through fear when you feel as if you don't know something. And in my corporate life, when I went in-house, the former general counsel at Halliburton is a gentleman by the name of Burt Cornelison. And he was probably the best leader I've ever had because, and and I think his leadership style was exemplified by a very short story. We were out with his leadership team and some outside counsel who were trying to get business from the company. And one of those partners asked him, well, what keeps you up at night? And he kind of chuckled and he said, nothing keeps me up at night that doesn't have to do with my children. You need to ask these other people at the table what keeps them up at night because that's why I hire the best. And it was just a real example for me from him about you surround yourself with great people and you let them do their jobs. So along the same lines, who have been your heroes? Oh my goodness. So I would have to say from a historical perspective, right? I have to go with people who I think really changed the law for diverse people, generally for African-Americans specifically. So that would be the Thurgood Marshalls, the Barbara Jordans, the Ruth Bader Ginsburgs of the world. But in my personal life, there are some, some people that have really stood out in my career in terms of helping me. So I would first identify Judge Mary Ellen Hicks in Fort Worth, Texas as a hero because she got me my very first legal job. I would have to call out Sharice Lilly, who is the former head of litigation at Ballard Spar and was the head of the Comcast Foundation in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who has been my mentor since I was a third year lawyer. Ben Wilson of Beverage and Diamond is the Black godfather of almost every African-American lawyer I know in the United States. I would have to call out Joseph West, who was CEO of the Minority Corporate Council Association and is now a partner at Dwayne Morris because he really brought this diversity and inclusion conversation to the forefront in a very different way. In addition to being a great trial lawyer, Kim Rucker and Janet Kelly are two female GCs, formerly of um, Conoco and Kraft, who 
helped me understand women's leadership and how it differs from men's leadership. So I'll stop there. But those are the people that when I think about, you know, who helped shape me as a lawyer and a leader, those are the folks that probably have had the greatest impact. Sherry, let's talk about your days at Halliburton. And I know that you had the tremendous opportunity to step into the chief ethics and compliance officer role as an SVP. Please share that story and what others can learn from this experience. I would probably say it happened through, first and foremost, no actual action of my own other than really trying to be a good employee. And that goes back to my relationship with the then general counsel, Burt Cornelison. I came into that organization out of a law firm, and I was candidly just happy to no longer be doing billable hours, right? And it was, there was lots of smart lawyers in the department, and I just really, really focused on doing my job. And I came to his attention, and he just, leaned forward and invested time in me. And he invested in helping me learn things that I did not know. And so he promoted me to be the corporate secretary of the organization. So I was able to be in front of the CEO and other senior leaders. I was able to be in front of the board. And so I held that job for three years. And when one of my colleagues, who was just an amazing lawyer and a long-term Halliburton employee, opted to give up the chief compliance officer role, the GC came in and said, you know, we want you to take on another challenge with this organization. And I remember wanting to think about it because at that time I was a new mom. I had a toddler and, you know, I'm a single mother. So I was like, oh my God, what does this new and bigger role mean? And I did it because I had a great deal of respect for him. And there were a few things he could have asked me to do that I wasn't willing to take on. And so I said, yes, You know, six months into the job, I walk into his office and I'm kind of laughing, but also kind of crying. And I said, I thought you liked me. (laughs) Why did you give me this job? But but Halliburton is a great organization and it was a wonderful learning experience for me. And if I had to pull a lesson out for people listening, I would say that, you know, you have to figure out how to build relationships and you've got to figure out how to put your best foot forward and you have to figure out how to humble brag. You know, there is something to be said for kind of shameless self-promotion so that your leaders understand the difference that you're making. And then a lot of it is just luck. You know, in-house law departments are very flat organizations. And so There isn't always an opportunity to move up, but there is always an opportunity to learn. Sherry, what advice would you give attorneys who are in private practice that want to go in-house? Oh, the the goal of leaving the billable hour and going (laughs) in-house. The first thing I would say is that being in-house is not easier than being at a law firm. You work just as hard. In some instances, you work harder, but you work differently. And so I think people who want to go in-house because they see it as some type of legal nirvana don't actually understand how hard in-house legal work can be. But setting that aside, I would say really know why you want to do it, because it is not a situation where you know, a lot of times you're going to take a pay cut to do it. You're going to have a lot of work. Most organizations require a certain amount of travel that you don't have any ability to hand off to anyone else. And so I would say, know why you want to do it. And if you decide it is for you, then you really have to focus on what kind of work, what industry, what parts of the country you want to live in, because It's not like, you know, at these 
huge international law firms, you can transfer the office within your own organization. If you decide for whatever reason you don't want to be somewhere, you are generally going to have to leave the organization to make a change. And so other than that, I would say look at postings for that industry, network with people in that industry, because a lot of in-house jobs are found through personal connection and really let your network know that you are looking to move in-house. And that is probably going to be the fastest way to get your name on the radar of a company, a hiring manager, or a recruiter, is if people actually know that's an interest of yours. I think you have probably done the best job explaining that than anyone else I've spoken with. Well, I appreciate that, Chris. Thank you. What advice would you give diverse attorneys who are in the middle of what we are being faced with in our nation and the bill coming due with, unfortunately, the race riots, the protests, the death of George Floyd and others? You know, first, it's it's a really, really difficult situation in the sense that on one hand, it's very black and white right? It is a right, wrong kind of situation. And so when I say black and white, I don't mean color, but there are no shades of gray in terms of what happened and the fact that it should not have happened. The fact that it's opened up this broader conversation is really about a sort of boiling pot that has been boiling for the 25 years, particularly that law firms and law departments have been having this conversation about diversity and inclusion and what that looks like. For many organizations, it's really been performative. They send out these wonderful marketing materials and it talks about how they believe in diversity and inclusion. But if we look at the number of diverse partners in these firms, if we look at the number of female partners in these firms, the numbers really have not moved. And so I think that what I hope comes from this and what I hope benefits diverse lawyers is that we start having real conversations and we start moving to real policies that change how law firms, the law, legal departments actually function. And I've been really pleased at the number of just really high profile, skilled lawyers that have spoken out on this. Don Prophet of Kostangi just had a wonderful article in law.com where he was very clear about these issues. Scott Bolden, who is a former managing partner of the DC office of Reed Smith, and Ben Wilson, the chairman emeritus of Beverage and Diamond, were interviewed for another publication. They were very clear about this. Joe West wrote a highly emotional and thoughtful piece, also published in law.com, about these issues. And I just think It's time for us to really, really do something as opposed to talking about doing something. And for lawyers that are in environments where they can affect these changes, I would encourage us all to really be bold and to step out a little bit more with regard to our thoughts on these issues and not just the thoughts, but suggestions about how to move forward in a way that is meaningful. That's tougher. I just want to say this. It's tougher for younger lawyers. And so I think that the higher up the chain you are, the more credibility you've retained in your organization. Hopefully it's easier to speak out. But I think now is the time. We're at a really important inflection point. And so I would encourage diverse lawyers, but also non-diverse allies to really seize this moment. And I think there are some non-diverse allies, some of the people that I've named that have been instrumental in my career have been white men. 
And so they're not the enemy, but they are very often uncomfortable with these conversations. And we've got to have the conversation and then turn those conversations into concrete action that change the circumstances of people in these situations. Sherry, how have you been affected by the murder of George Floyd in the Minneapolis protests? I, Chris, <laughs> that's a, it's a little bit of a loaded question in the sense that I had a really hard time over the last two weeks. Um, a hard time because it's just so exhausting. And it is painful, it is personally painful to see so many people deny that this is a problem and to attempt to excuse this behavior. And I have lots of nieces, I have lots of nephews. I have personally been followed in stores. I have personally been deathly afraid in instances I have been pulled over by the police. And I'm a woman. I can't imagine the fear that Black men live with because it's what I feel times, you know, some infinite exponential. And so to see this play out in the streets has been it's been really painful, but I have to say, I am so proud of these young people. I am so proud of these protesters. I am so proud of them speaking up. And candidly, I'm really, really excited about the number of, of different people, of different religions and races and ethnic backgrounds who have also taken to the streets. Because as hurtful as this is to admit, the presence of white people in the protests gives them more legitimacy in the eyes of some than they would have if it was just all people who looked like me. And so I think that coalition across racial lines has really caused people who otherwise would not think differently about these things to think differently. But I was in tears having to explain this to my 10 year old. And in further convulsing tears, when she had to explain it to some of her friends from school, none of whom are diverse. And, you know, as a parent, it just breaks your heart to have your 10 year old have to explain murder. It's just really difficult. Sherry, thank you. Really, thank you for your vulnerability. It's a gift. I'm just grateful for you feeling safe enough to share. Well, I appreciate the sincere question. Sherry, transitioning, you shared with me that you're a single mom of a 10-year-old daughter. I am. Let's talk about the challenge and the joy of managing family, extended family, and being an executive. What are some takeaways for my listeners? So, you know, it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. I tell people about my journey to motherhood that I started late and ended early. <laughs> because I had my daughter at 40. And, you know, that women who are of childbearing age will know this term, you know, you go see the doctor and they talk about you being of advanced maternal age. And so it was just this really different experience of having achieved a lot in my career and then having now this little person who depended on me. And, and so I'll tell you, it's been the greatest joy of my life to be a mom by far, but it's also the hardest job I've ever had. I spent about two years as a stay at home mother. I was like, oh Lord, I've got to go back to work <laughs> because it was incredibly difficult. And women who make that choice for the extended period, my hats are off to them because people want to somehow have the impression that they're sitting around working out and eating bonbons. That is not the case. Um, and so I would say what I learned is that you really have to be very 
comfortable with your particular parenting style. And I traveled a lot when my daughter was small. And in order to make her comfortable at the time, there was no Zoom or FaceTime. It was Skype. And so I got her a Skype account and I would Skype her from all over the world and I would show her my hotel room. I would show her where I was sleeping. So she had some sense of connectedness and I would pull out a globe and show her where I was going and tell her how long it was going to take for mom to get there. And honestly, until she was probably six years old, I would talk to her on the phone and she would say, mommy, is it daytime or nighttime in your place? Right? Because I was traveling so far. But my three takeaway tips for man or woman who are managing, you know, their children in, in having a high profile job, stop using the term work-life balance. There's no such thing. It is coming up with a plan to manage the chaos because there is always going to be chaos. And really setting realistic expectations for things that you can do. So I outsourced a whole lot of stuff. I've never done my daughter's laundry because I just didn't have time for that. Somebody else did. And I got a housekeeper because I wanted to spend time with her versus cleaning the house. And I learned to work differently. If there were things that I wanted to do with her, I would tell my senior leadership, hey, I'm leaving work at three o'clock because we're having the Halloween parade, but I'll be back online at 830 after her bedtime and really found a way to the extent I could to make both my work schedule and my life schedule meet. And you have to accept a lot of help. My daughter is very fortunate that she has a literal brigade of godmothers that she refers to as her TTs. And those women have saved my life in moments where I could not be the best mother possible. And so I would say outsource, ask for help, accept help, and set expectations at your place of employment. Sherry, last question. And forgive me, I'm doing a little bit uh, different. This is a two-part question. The first question is, what are your superpowers? I would probably say strategy. I've always tended to be able to see the whole picture and how the pieces fit together, which has been very helpful to me in my life and career. I have always been open to, willing to accept and to act on any type of constructive feedback that makes me better as a person, as a mother, as a friend, as a lawyer. So I think that is, has been helpful to me in my life. And I would probably say my interest in people. One of the things that I've discovered over the last, you know, 10 or so years of my career is I get really excited when members of my team can be pushed to the limit and pushed to learn new things and to do new things and to step out on faith and try things that make them better lawyers. And to the extent that I can help that and help guide that and provide that level of development, that has been something I've really enjoyed. And if the feedback I've gotten from those individuals is any indication, I've been fairly successful at it. And the second part of that question is, what is your kryptonite? Wow, Chris, that's hard. Um, you know, champagne and a charcuterie platter, maybe? <laughs> Perfect answer. That's excellent, Sherry. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for your time today. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity to chat with you. Thank you, everyone who listened to this episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. If you haven't already, please take a moment and subscribe. Also, we would love your feedback. You can leave feedback in three easy ways. You can go to the blog post on our website. You can click Give Feedback link in the show notes on your device. And then thirdly, you can text the phrase LFL podcast to the number 44222. That's LFL P-O-D-C-A-S-T. And thank you.
Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.